Funny how a day pans out. <laughs> G'day, I'm Gavin from Hurley's Fly Fishing and welcome to another episode of On The Fly. Today we're up in northeast Victoria, right on a, one of the most magnificent trout streams in Australia. It's loaded full of browns and rainbows. You do get some good sized ones in here as well. Pretty early season, so we're gonna look to target them with some nymphs under an indicator. Later on the year, uh, it's renowned here for a lot of grasshoppers uh, and other terrestrials, so we can go on the dry fly. But initially, we're going to put a few nymphs, keep them down deep, and hopefully put a few in front of a, uh, a couple of good-sized trout. Before we go, we want to let other people know, if anglers come here now, we want them to know whether we've gone upstream or downstream, because it's always good to fish water first. So we'll put a sign on, say that we've gone upstream, we can leave that on our windshield, so when another angler comes, he knows which way we've gone. I mean, we don't own the water, we've got to uh, share it, but it's good if we can help somebody else out and let them know where we've gone, so they can go in the other direction. All just helps to make it a good day. Beautiful day in October. Sun shining. A couple of days ago, Richmond won the flag. Now I'm walking up a river, about to catch some fish. You struggle to get any better than that. Something I always go fishing with is a wading star. There's, uh, I, I guess, crossing here now, it's a bit deeper, there's a bit of flow. It just gives you that extra third leg that. Uh, uh, not every man has. Um, just that stabiliser is really good. And also I like to use it when I'm walking through some long grass as well. I'd rather it be uh, at that distance than uh, up much closer. We're gonna start off with, we've got two nymphs. Just to get it down there, under an indicator. So it's a great uh, system to use particularly when there's a bit of flow around and the water is a little bit chilly. So that will indicate to us when the fish takes these, uh, either one of these nymphs and hopefully they're gonna be right down near the bottom. At this time of year, you're generally gonna get the fish uh, literally on the bottom. They're not gonna be mid water. They're not gonna be right up high looking for insects from the top because they're literally not there. So we want our flies right down near the bottom. And uh, because the water's a bit colder too, they're probably less likely to move great distances to find your fly. So we've got to do probably more casts than what you normally would too in a particular area. So um, certainly uh, find a, a place where you think there's likely to be a fish and have a couple of casts, maybe ultra at a foot each time. And eventually you're gonna get that fly right in that right spot. Here we go, and that didn't take long. We've literally been here, or well, three casts, and uh, it's worked out pretty well. Oh, oh, and it's just got off. That takes the fun out of it a little bit. But that's ideal. If you can get down to a river, have a plan in place, and you go, well, I reckon there's likely to be a fish here. You know they're gonna be feeding down deep. So you put on you know, your weighted um, nymphs under your indicator, and you work out an area. Well, I'm looking at there, there's fast water on the right side. On the inside, it's a little bit shallower. So that fish can be a little bit lazy and then duck in and get the food, like what's happened there. You don't always land them, uh, which you know, makes for a pretty ordinary show if you, if you keep doing that all day. But um, the main thing is to, to do your cast, you've sussed it out and you get a take. To me, that's what fly fishing's about. You know, we didn't get a photo, but uh, I'm sure we frightened him enough to know that uh, he'll learn for next time. But as we walk up, you know, we'll do the same again, put the same system into practice, and hopefully we'll come up trumps. But um, it's a good start, it's a good start. Oh, 
always ready now with, uh, with an indicator. I mean, you, you would have heard at various times, people will say, you know, when the fish takes, you know, it's God save the queen. Uh, and what that does is allow for that fish to come up and eat it and to turn down before you set the hook. So that's where that comes from. It's that pause to give it time to turn down so you get the hook up. When we're fishing with nymphs and an indicator, what happens is those flies, maybe even in front of the indicator, could be the side, could be a bit of slack in there, lots of things can happen. But if that fish eats it, it'll only take a couple of seconds. If I put you know, a little bit of rubbish on your tongue, you'd spit it out straight away as well. But that fish will taste it, realise it's not food, because they eat for a living, he'll spit it out straight away. And the time it takes for that indicator to go down, because you don't know where the flies are, that's enough time for him to, to spit the hook and you don't get the hook up. As soon as you see that indicator go down, you've got to rip it like it owes you money. And that's, you're going to set the hook most times. So you've got to be ready. You've got to expect that indicator to go down. So you're like a spring, like then, as soon as it goes down, you lift straight away. You don't go, oh, it's down, and then think about it, and then lift. You've really got to uh, be on the ball and ready to set that hook straight away, and you're going to uh, hook a lot more fish than you're going to miss. What we've got here, we've got an overhanging tree. Now, I want to cast up to the confluence here where I think there'll probably be a fish sitting there. If I just do a normal over, um, over the shoulder cast, I'm going to put my flies straight up into that tree every single time, which takes the fun out of a bit. All we're going to do, it's nothing drastic, all we're going to do is turn our rod on the side, and that just keeps your, your arcs and your loops going quite low and parallel to the water. And then I can cast up above this tree, put the fly in there, the fish eats it, and you look like a superstar. So pretty simple, turn it on its side, you can cast right up above that overhanging tree. Same with there's any branches overhanging on, on the side, it pays to get your fly right in on the edge. Because fish know that beetles and bugs, all that sort of thing, drop off branches in a bush on the side of a, uh, a little river. So it pays to put your flies to where the fish are. What we want to do as well, when you're casting, particularly across current, what we want to do is mend. So we don't want that fly with a big bend in the fly line, because then it like races the fly because it becomes tight too early. So what we do is cast upstream and we want to throw the line upstream. So that allows the flies to drift very naturally until it gets down below you, and then it can slowly swing up. And that's not a bad thing too, on a river, particularly even if you get a bit bigger, as these flies, they're, they're, you can imagine they sink right down, as the line gets tight, they'll swing up too, which is what happens to an insect, like a nymph limbs over a rock, for a couple of years, once it swims to the surface to hatch out to a flying insect, it rises. And that really can entice a take from the fish if he's sitting there and seeing something coming up. So sometimes it's good to, uh, cast upstream, you do a little bit of a mend to get that fly line in front of the flies, lets it drift very naturally and sink. As it gets level with you, it's a target, and then as it gets below you, it starts to rise up and you can quite often get a good take there as well. So uh, let your flies fish out the whole run and you'd be surprised at how many fish you can get. Even when you're uh, not expecting it. Got a great little bubble line. And that's where, from the surface anyway, it shows you where all the water is funneled to. And as you would imagine, that would bring a lot of the food as well. So we'll cast up along that bubble line. And at various times of the year, that can bring uh, a lot of fish, particularly when there's grasshoppers or uh, insects hatching, they will get funneled right to the surface there on a bubble line. 
So it's a really good place to uh, concentrate a lot of your casts where the bubbles are. Another way to cast as well, if you do have a, a, like a little bit of a back cast, but obviously you can't see it. So what we can do is literally turn and face the opposite direction we're going to cast, because then I can direct where that back cast goes, because it's your forward cast. So I can see that gap through there. I'll make sure my fly line's through that, and then on my normal back cast, I release it, and uh, your back cast turns into your forward cast. And you can really get into some spots that normally you couldn't. So it pays just to practice different uh, techniques, particularly when you get into smaller streams like what we've got here. Uh, and there's quite a lot around. You're going to get a lot more fish in these sort of waters rather than the big open ones like the Goulburn and stuff where you've got plenty of room everywhere. Practice on this smaller stuff because uh, you're going to have a lot of fun and you're going to catch a lot more fish. Now interesting, uh, I often take a thermometer with me out on uh, our fishing trips because um, the water temperature plays a vital role to how the fish are going to uh, act. Um, at the moment it's an early season about 12 degrees which is not too bad ideally i like it to be about you know perhaps up to about 14 15 then the fish become very active but also so do the um the the food source like the the, the nymphs the duns grasshoppers all that sort of stuff they all play a role because that's about the temperature you want you know as the season progresses so uh, we're only a couple of degrees off that at the moment but what that does it slows up the metabolism of the fish when the water's a bit chilly so um, they don't need to eat as much and they don't move as far to get the food so it needs a lot of more rep repetitive casting to make sure that that fly gets in front of the fish and he sees it and he'll react to it as it warms up then they will move a lot further so um, often I'll take this out in summer and you might find I guess in Australia they always say the early bird catches the worm because you've got to get up early before the water gets too hot and it will because of the sun so early in the morning you might find that the water's perhaps you know 15 or 16 which is ideal as the sun hits it middle of the day might get up to 18 even 20 uh, and that's a little bit too hot a lot of the times for trout and then you get the evening, you get the insects again and the water temperature cools down and the fish react as well. So um, it pays to have a thermometer and uh, you can often check what the temperature is and you'll have a good idea of what the fish are going to do at the same time. Now we've got an interesting little uh, area here. The water comes down but we've got like a backwater here and it literally reverses the flow of the river. So you just got to be mindful fish here are going to be facing upstream. If they're in that backwater there, they're literally going to be facing you. So you can still target them if you can see the fish, particularly if it's shallow. We need to perhaps cast in there and let it drift towards them. So you're casting on this side of the fish if you can see them there. Or if you're letting it uh, drift down, just be mindful it's going to come and, and swing back around as well. So uh, once you get these little back eddies, they're a really good fish holding place as well. And fish can come out of nowhere. The beauty of this system we've got too, we're using an indicator, um, which is one of the Smith's indicators. So we, we loop that on there, but we can adjust it. So I've got a, a drop off here, which goes to quite deep water. And I've got maybe six foot down to my first fly. I think I need to adjust it so I can just literally slide that up. And I can go to eight, maybe even 10 foot. And that'll allow that fly to get down deeper on this particular drop off. So I can cast up, let it sink and we'll get down that little bit deeper and that might be what you need to do. If, if what you're doing isn't working, you've got to try something else and simply by adjusting the depths that your flies go may well be the difference. You don't always have to fish up in front of you. You can uh, cast up in front, let it drift down, a little bit of a mend to allow those flies to sink. As it gets level, you can take the fly line off the water and just let that drift through 
almost till it comes up tight. And quite often, bang, you can get a take on that as well as it, those flies rise up. So uh, it's never over till it's over. There you go. That's sometimes what it takes, walking up a river, getting a bit despondent, and trying to do a forward cast. And you can't because you have a fish on the end of your line. Well, there you go. I'm not sure it's the biggest one we've got, but um, yeah, it certainly is a fish. Um, <laughs> I guess you still can claim it, but um, yeah, you might not get too many photos of it or tell too many people about it, but um, yeah. And that's interesting, I'll just get that hook out and I'll let him go, but I love the little brown. I'm good to go. And that is when I'm going to cast, it's lifting that fly up just by uh, accidentally, but it's lifting it up so that fish thinks that that's an emerging insect and he whacks it. So. Um, yeah, sometimes even by accident you're doing the right thing. We've got a magnificent pool here that runs 40 odd metres. Just by, uh, I guess in America it would be a beaver dam, but that's just a, a tree that's fallen over and created uh, a really big pool. Slow water, but it can hold a lot of fish, so uh, we'll have to work this pretty consistently and hopefully there could be a big fish underneath it. Uh, went under and uh, I guess with indicator uh, nymph fishing you've always got to be ready to strike and uh, lucky enough with this, you can never uh, strike too early. So that's one of the, uh, the things where it's good to uh, be early. But you've got to be expecting that indicator to be going down all the time and almost you're like a spring ready to strike straight away. Because by the time that indicator has gone down, that fish is halfway to spitting that fly out because he eats for a living and he knows that that bit of fur, feather and metal is not food and he'll get rid of that. So you've really got to set that hook quite quickly. And you want your flies to be bouncing along the bottom. So every now and then that's going to snag up on a rock and you're going to strike nothing there. But that means it's in the right place. So don't be too perturbed if you're uh, nymphs, it's, it's, the indicator's going down, there's no fish on the end, it means your flies are in the right place. And this is a, uh, what we call a, um, it's called a gum, it's a gum trout, and that's not a bad one. I would say that's probably, I don't know, that's near on a metre, which is probably a record for me, particularly on a three weight. Um, and that's in pretty good neck too. So that's just showing the water's in, in pretty good quality um, to produce a, um, a gum trout like that. It's pretty ideal. And uh, we probably won't worry with a photo for that one, but um, again, it's, it's just good. You just know that your flies are in the right spot when you can catch a gum trout like that. And with everything, we always practice catch and release. So let's, uh, send him on his way for, for somebody else to catch him next time they're here as well. So um, all good fun. Plenty, plenty of, uh, of lovely trout in this river system. There's 
one is often two, and always a bit smaller. But uh, uh, most days you'd probably be a keeper. You know, good over oh, a foot and a half, so not a bad one. Yeah, so still, still good. That's slightly different. That's called a um, it's a, a snow gum trout, so it's a little bit different there. They're a little bit skinnier than the uh, the gum trout. Catch and release. Now because we're not walking up a crystal clear New Zealand trout stream where we can see the fish from 50 metres away, we've got to put our cast, particularly early in the season, even with good glasses, we've got to put our cast where we think fish are. So it's a bit of prospecting. So if you got to an area, as much as we need to cast and, and fish it effectively, you don't want to put 100 casts in the same spot. So I would break, break this up into grids and you might have every foot is a different grid. So you might cast there and then a foot to the right, a foot to the right, a foot to the right, and let it drift all the way through. So um, don't put too many casts in the one spot unless you know there's a fish there. And uh, you can cover a bit of water that way and uh, it's far more effective. Oh, nice little one there. There's a lovely little bit of water just behind that tr that tree and I'll uh, just get our net out get him in I'll just bring him over a bit different to the last one we got was a brown and uh, this is a rainbow and they're quite often very aggressive feeders and uh, lovely little fish just the same again we might not mount this one either but uh, sizes and everything and that's the, uh, the log where you can see this it just diverts a bit of the water flow and uh, that's what's going to hold up uh, a good little position for the fish where it can stay in there out of the main current but all the food's deflected to him as well so uh, a great little area and that's what um, it pays to do when you're walking up a river to look for places where if you're a lazy trout where would you sit and uh, that's certainly where they'll be and we'll get this little uh, beautiful little fish and you can just see the difference there. There's no red spots. There is that red streak right along the top there. And they quite often have that little bit of red on the gills there and spots on the tail. So they're a beautiful little fish and very aggressive feeders, which um, is good for fly fishermen. Um, so that's a, a great little fish there. I'll just get that hook out. And this uh, little river and most of the rivers here have got a mixture of browns and rainbows and uh, the browns tend to be a little bit more cautious and the, the rainbows tend to uh, help us uh, fly fishermen out. And uh, we can let this little fella grow up to be big. Rainbows in the wild will probably live for uh, you know five to six to seven to eight years and uh, they can grow quite big. Generally in a river like this, you know, like that's probably your average size. That to about a pound is quite a reasonable fish, but um, you can get them, you know, two pound, three pound, and he's pretty good and off he goes. So yeah, so getting a fish like that just makes you realize you're doing the right thing. You've got to change things. Might be your indicator, might be the weight of the fly, might be where you're casting to make sure that it gets down to that depth. Uh, and then it all comes about and works out and it just, um, not that it's the most important thing in the world whether you catch fish or not, it's not life-threatening but it just makes you feel a whole lot better. <laughs>